everyone. Thank you for listening to our fourth webinar of the 2023 CKF webinar series. This webinar will focus on blood donation. Every year, over 16 million blood components are transfused in the United States. Unfortunately, there is a constant blood shortage nationwide, as only 3% of Americans donate annually. My name is Jesse Rochelle. I am the Executive Director for the Chris Klug Foundation, and I'll be introducing you to today's panelists and moderating today's session. If you are a regular to our series, you're used to seeing these webinars led by our Programs and Communications Director, Anna morgan Florty. But as Anna is getting married this weekend, congratulations, Anna, I said I would be happy to fill in. I am particularly excited to be facilitating this discussion. I love blood donation. I love donating, I love talking about donating, and I love recruiting new donors. For those healthy enough to do it, it is such an easy way to make a really big difference. I would first like to thank our generous sponsor, the Hearts for Rust Foundation, who helps make this series possible. If you will be in New York um, in September around the 22nd, check out their 10th anniversary fundraising golf tournament and dinner. More information can be found at heartsforrust.org. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions before today's session. If you have further questions for today's panelists, please send them to info at chrisklugfoundation.org. And if you are interested in learning about the other topics we will discuss during this year's series, please head to chrisklugfoundation.org backslash CKF webinar series. Now I would like to welcome today's panelists and give them a moment to introduce themselves and the organizations they are representing. First, I would like to introduce Frida Bennett, the Donor Resource Coordinator for Children's Hospital of Colorado. For our Denver area friends, please note CKF partners with Children's to host a blood drive on National Donor Day, February 14th. Hello, and thank you so much for inviting the Blood Donor Center at Children's Hospital Colorado to participate today. It's great to be with you all. Um, the bulk of my duties here is um, organizing the mobile blood drive program. I also help with um, running the uh, blood donor center at the front desk and just working with donors in general. Thanks for being with us, Rita. Next, we have Andrea Seffarelli, Senior Vice President and Corporate Communications and Public Affairs for New York Blood Center. Andrea, I actually visited one of your blood centers last November after the New York Marathon and donated platelets there. Thank you so much. So uh, I, it's my pleasure to be here. I've been with the blood center for 30 years. Um, New York Blood Center certainly operates in the greater New York area, but we also operate in 13 states. Uh, those are um, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, Delaware, Rhode Island, Kansas City, Missouri, Nebraska, and Minnesota. Uh, we provide over a million blood and blood products uh, to, uh, you know, serving a, a footprint of about 75 million people. We are also extremely proud that we were the first and largest producer of convalescent plasma during COVID and um, produce uh, those early life-saving products uh, for 42 states and four foreign countries. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here. That's amazing, thank you. Next up is Brooke Way, Communications Manager for Vitalent. Um, our foundation coordinates blood drives with Vitalent every month in Carbondale and then up here in Aspen on odd numbered months. Yeah, hi, thank you for having me. I'm the Communications Manager for Vitalent here in Colorado. Uh, Vitalent's a nationwide network, so we are in uh, 28 states. We have more than 120 donation centers across the U.S., and we host blood drives regularly as well across the United States, as well as um, with you guys in our uh, mountain territory. So. We're so excited to partner with coordinators like you uh, to help get the word out about the critical need for blood donations year round, especially right now in the summer months. Um, so thank you so much for having us today. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so thanks everybody for joining us and we're gonna jump in and start um, answering some questions regarding blood donation. Frida, I'm gonna start with you. Often people rule themselves out of becoming a blood donor before truly exploring the option. 
Can you talk about who can become a blood donor and what might restrict a person? Sure, uh, yes. Many people don't realize that they're eligible to donate blood. And it may be because they were deferred from donating in the past for some place they lived or traveled to or for a medication or for a medical condition. Um, eligibility guidelines are always being reassessed and updated as medical knowledge changes and new information becomes available. So they might not be deferred anymore. <laughs> for example, um, if someone had traveled to a malarial risk region, that was once a one year deferral, but now it's a three month deferral. And for tattoos, there used to be a deferral time of 12 months, but now there's no deferral so long as the tattoo was applied in a state certified clinic and the site is completely healed. And anyone who meets our donation eligibility criteria can become a donor. And we do ask several pre-screening questions before someone signs up to give, just to make sure that it's safe for them to become a donor at Children's Hospital Colorado. And if someone is impacted by one or more of our eligibility criteria. The Blood Donor Center at Children's Hospital Colorado has many knowledgeable resources who are able to provide additional eligibility guidance. And if anybody would like to become a donor at Children's Colorado and has an eligibility question, they can call the Blood Donor Center at 720-777-5398 or visit our website. We'll, there, they'll, we'll find our most current eligibility guidelines there and they can also find a mobile blood drive to give at or make an appointment to give at our center here in Aurora. Fantastic. Andrea or Brooke, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I would just echo that most people are eligible. So there's a lot of misconceptions. You know, I take medication. I couldn't possibly give blood, um, but many medications are fine. You know, for instance, uh, antibiotics uh, are a problem if you're sick. So it's not the medication so much as that you might have a virus that you're fighting. Um, so even some sort of cancers are okay or have limited uh, donation windows. So we always like to say the best thing to do is don't presume that you're not eligible, but instead just ask. And very often you can call your local blood center kind of describe your criteria and you probably will be surprised to find out you're eligible. Yeah, um, one exciting update with the FDA recently is the mad cow deferral too. So a lot of our military um, service members were deferred for quite a while because of the mad cow risk. And now that has actually, that deferral has been lifted uh, for many of those people. So um, that's an exciting change. Vitalant Research Institute's also doing a lot of really amazing work to make blood donation more inclusive. Um, so the recent FDA policy update on that um, is very exciting as well. And we're, we're really uh, excited to make those uh, updates and our policy changes here in our Vitalant Center soon. Can you, um explain a little bit more about that inclusivity, inclusivity change that's happening. And is there a mm -hmm. approximate timeline for it? Yeah, so I don't have an exact date. We're hoping for um, within the next month or so. Uh, but yeah, so now our questionnaire is more inclusive. So, you know, all genders are asked the same questions. Um, so before it was a little bit different. Uh, so now, you know, a lot of gay and bisexual men um, are eligible to donate uh, if they are in monogamous, you know, relationships. There's a lot more details that get into that, and it's very heavily uh, regulated by the FDA. So by Talent Works with the FDA, we follow their guidelines and they've made some changes um, with the inclusivity aspect. So if you're interested in learning more, please uh, visit, you know, vitalent.org. We have that information listed there. Fantastic. What about if a person has been sick or recently gotten a vaccine? How long should they wait before signing up to donate blood? So uh, if you're sick, uh, it's generally you need to be 100% recovered well before you even present to donate. And vaccines, I guess that I would put a question back to you. Are you talking about the COVID vaccine, which is what uh, people think about? But of course, there's all types of vaccines. So vaccine um, uh, waiting periods um, 
or no deferrals have been part of our criteria really for decades. So you could get a flu shot 10 years ago or measles, mumps, and rubella, you know, things that kids get before school or, you know, through their um, adolescent years. Each of those vaccines either has, you're, you're fine, you can get the vaccine and immediately donate, or might have a small waiting period. And that criteria is readily available on all of our websites. The COVID vaccine is actually fine. You can donate, get the vaccine and immediately donate good information. Okay, next up, Andrea, I'm going to go to you with this one to start. What steps should be taken by a donor before and after their appointment to help guarantee a successful donation? That's a great question. So first of all, I think your mindset that, because uh, I've been at so many high school and college blood drives where the students sort of psych themselves out and get themselves anxious. So uh, go with a friend if you can. Go with a family member and make it a, 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 an experience that you do together or a coworker, um, because I can guarantee it's going to be easier than you think. Uh, having this is the one time where salty snacks the night before um, are good for you. They sort of plump you up and help you stay hydrated. Eat well. And again, I like to sort of tease youth donors, uh, a Red Bull and a Snickers bar is not a breakfast. So eat well and healthy and be well hydrated. And then plan to spend an hour. Uh, hopefully we're doing a better job in, and it isn't a full hour, but first you're doing the registration and we're getting your demographics. And then you have your medical history where we check your, your hemoglobin or hematocrit and we're going through your questions air. Then there's an arm scrub to make sure that the needle is being inserted through a sterile portion of your arm. The giving blood is five to 11 minutes on average. And then the best part is juice and cookies at the end. So well rested, uh, well hydrated, eat well, and bring a friend. Well, very good advice. I have talked to many people who confuse blood donation with a blood draw and think they're supposed to fast before it, which does not go well. Brooke or Frida, any other tips for success? Anything you've seen with people, either fears or phobias or things, um, aftercare things they should be looking to do? Um, our basics are just be prepared by wearing a short sleeve shirt or something that where the sleeves can be easily rolled up for access and drink plenty of fluids, eat a full meal two hours before the donation. And just know that it's okay to relax. You're in good hands when you come in to donate. Yeah, I would just say some people are a little nervous because they're scared of needles. You know, we hear that a lot is the main reason. I've never donated, I don't like needles. Well, we just suggest giving it a try. You may, you know, be fine and you may not be so scared when you're there. And our phlebotomists are well trained to make you as comfortable as possible. They do this every single day. <laughs> so they know how to uh, make you comfortable. So yeah, just give it a try. And if you really can't give, just spread the word. That's another way to help if you're unable. That's a great point that there's other ways to get involved without just donating. Um, and they could sign up to be a coordinator for a blood drive, right? And help uh, get the blood mobile in places. Lots of options. Okay, Brooke, I'm going back to you. Can you walk us through the process for a blood donation? Andrea just touched on quite a few. Yeah, so we kind of touched on making sure you're eligible first and foremost. You know, if you have questions, go to the eligibility section of the website. Um, there's a number to call if you have questions about medication. Once you know you're eligible, you just come into our center. Uh, Vitalant has a fast track, so you can actually fill out all of your health information before you get there to speed up the process. Uh, but if you come and you haven't, they'll allow you to do it there. And then you do a quick health check uh, with our text to make sure you're good to go to donate that day. 
Uh, for whole blood, it takes less than an hour. It's very fast. People don't realize that. Um, the actual time in our chair is less than 10 minutes. Um, and so then after you donate, uh, you will be asked to wait and eat a snack to regain your energy, make sure you're okay to leave. Uh, but, you know, we also do platelet donation, which that could take longer. That's, you know, about two hours. Same with plasma at our centers. Um, so you really got to decide what you'd like to give and what you're eligible to give. And our phlebotomist will help you determine what you'd like to give based on your body type. Um, any additional things to add, Andrea or Frida? Anything different for you guys? Yeah, I would say people don't understand that you can give multiple things. So when people think, oh, I give blood, well, that's what flows out of your arm. It's actually whole blood and it's uh, divided into multiple components. So red cells, plasma, um, small amount of platelets uh, and even goes beyond there. So what you sh what you're willing to donate and what we'd like you to donate um, might be different. So how much time you have, but each, so you have the eight blood types. So type O negative is the uh, universal blood type. It's also quite rare. It sort of varies by state to state, but in general, it's around 6% of the population, but it's a universal blood type because it's what's transfused in a trauma. So if you're in a car accident and they don't have time to figure out that you're a B pause, they're going to give you ONEG. And so trauma centers can use 20% ONEG when it's only present in about 6% of the population. So if you're an ONEG donor, we, when we first meet you, um, we're very often interested in having you be our friend for your full lifetime. So you're that special. And then other types, so AB is the universal plasma type. Um, so we need less of your red cells and you're the special plasma donor. And then it varies from there. Um, so your willingness to donate and then your blood type and then even your body mass um, can turn into different products. And Jesse, you said you donated platelets. Platelets last just five to seven days. Um, I say five to seven because two of the days is actually lost in bacterial testing. They're stored at room temperature and they're needed for cancer um, and leukemia patients, others as well, but they're sticky. They're what keep uh, prevent internal bleeding. So they're stored at room temperature in constant motion and platelet donors, you know, platelet products last a week. So uh, very difficult product to manage and takes about two hours to donate. Brooke or Frida, would you like to follow up with anything on the different types of um, components that you can donate? Um, any advice to people if they're curious about learning more what is good for their type or their time or their ability? Um, just to elaborate on platelets a little bit, um, we always need platelets here at Children's Hospital Colorado quite a bit because um, we have many patients coming here for treatments for cancer, getting chemotherapy. Chemotherapy um, radiation destroys the platelets. So we always need platelet donors quite a bit to give here at Children's Colorado to help these kids recover. Can you explain how the platelet donation varies um, or differs from whole blood? Yep, so there's an apheresis machine that the donor is hooked up to and it takes about two hours and we separate the unit into its different components during the appointment and the donor gets their red blood cells back during the appointment. Um, so that's why it does take about two hours altogether. I can speak from experience that it's not too bad though, especially at Vital and Lowry Center because each bed has its own TV that you can watch while you're donating and they keep you warm and bring you snacks. And so if you don't mind having a needle in your arm for a couple hours, it's not a bad way to pass the time. Yes, we also offer warm blankets. Perfect. <laughs> Um, and then, so if a person was interested in checking it out, you said it's dependent on their blood type, their time, body mass is even a factor, anything else that determines what's a best fit for people to do? 
your platelet count. So you can have a small female, you know, 120 pounds that has a platelet count of 400. So it might take them a little longer. So platelet donations are interesting. The apheresis machine, a kit goes on top and it's a closed system. So one of the most common questions is, if you're gonna take some of my blood out, don't put anything back, but it's a enclosed sterile blood bag that sits on top of the machine. Uh, and you can have a high platelet count and a willingness to sit and you can donate a double, which is two units of platelets or even a triple. So a larger guy with a high platelet count can donate a triple platelet. The apheresis machines, it's a Greek word that means to take out and you can really customize. You can do a platelet red, a double platelet red, a platelet plasma. And so the technology, uh, is really quite sophisticated. And what it does is it goes into a centrifuge and the weight of the different pro uh, products in your whole blood kind of layer like a cappuccino. And then the machine goes after whatever layer they're seeking. And that's why they can be quite sophisticated in, in going after um, the products that are a perfect match with the donor and the need. And it also gives you... Um, uh, fluids back. So uh, if you can, as you said, stand the needle in your arm, which is a smaller needle than a whole blood donation, it's quite smaller, um, then it's a, it can be a relaxing couple hours. And if people are interested in doing platelets or plasma, that's generally in a center and whole blood and um, power red could be done on mobile units, correct? Correct. Okay, Frida, I'm coming back to you. Can you explain to us which blood types are considered rare and why it is so important for those with rare blood types to donate? Rare blood types are pretty much the one that isn't available when a child needs it. Um, but if you're speaking by percentages, rare blood types are gonna be, um, for example, AB negative is the rarest, comprising of just 1% of the population. Um, then there's B negative, 2% of the population, AB positive, which is 4% of the population, um, A negative, which is around 6% of the population, and O negative, 7% of the population. Um, we need all blood types because we may have children in our care in need of any of these blood types. So we need donations from those with rare blood types as well. But just to elaborate, we also need donors with common blood types. Um, and that is because many of our patients have common blood types as well. A positive and O positive are amongst the most common blood types. So we have a higher number of patients in our care in need of those particular blood types. I think you make an excellent point there with what you said at the beginning that whatever is rare is what is needed. There's also, um, New York Blood Center has the largest rare blood inventory. So there's the eight blood types, but there's also rare antigens. Where this matters is if you're say a sickle cell patient or thalassemia, and there's one sickle cell patient that we uh, recently looked up and she, need, she required blood from 300 individual donors over just four years. When you receive regular transfusions over a lifetime, your need for OPAS gets more and more complicated. And then it becomes the rare antigens like CE and KEL. And these have been identified by scientists all over the world. And the best way to describe it is you might be looking for a black blazer. So fine, but then you need a size and then you want it to be double breasted. And then you want it to have gold buttons and then you want it to have a satin lapel. The more you receive blood transfusions, you stay in O positive, but your need to match so that you don't have transfusion complications gets more complicated throughout your life. So an average knee surgery needs an O pos, but someone with sickle cell might need very specific antigen matched blood to their ethnicity. So that brings up an interesting point regarding race and ethnicity, that there can be better matches within similar races and ethnicities and backgrounds of people. And so it's important for minorities to get out there and donate as well. Do you guys see 
um, a shortage of minorities coming in or unique um, ethnic backgrounds? And is there a way to encourage people to come in? So the, the pandemic devastated our um, diverse donations. Um, and I think it's a matter of convenience. So pre-pandemic, we were in every high school twice a year, every college. Um, our, we had our donor coaches or buses going to, you know, parishes and places of worship. And so first the pandemic shut down everything. And then our world has changed, right? There are fewer people going to services. People are working remotely or blended schedules. Um, our buses, ironically, sort of rotted for three years, not being used. So the bus that makes it convenient to go to a diverse neighborhood. So we are looking to rebuild our um, uh, diverse donations, which requires incredible education and partnership and then convenience. Um, and also having donor centers. I think we would all realize that our donor centers became critical during the pandemic versus going to people. And so we've realized that we need to provide accessibility in these underserved communities if we expect donations from these same blood donors. Brooke, did you see something similar with Vitalant and the Vitalant blood mobiles and access getting places? Yeah, I mean, Andrea said it perfectly. We experienced the same thing here in Colorado. Uh, luckily, you know, our donors in Colorado are amazing. And we were one of the states that was, did better during the pandemic than others. Um, we just have that kind of community here, which is amazing. But we really are working on getting more diversity into our donor base. We have been challenged with that. And we would like to serve uh, those patients that may be better matched with more diverse donors. So that's something we really are working on as an organization to do more outreach, um, partner with community organizations to get the word out, uh, hopefully work with legislation as well to provide, you know, funding for these types of um, outreach efforts. Uh, so things like that, we really would like uh, to increase that donor base uh, across the board, as well as new donors. So we really need those new donors to come in because some of our regular donors are aging out or they, their health has declined and they're not able to come in. We have like 90 gallon donors here in Colorado we celebrate because they give those platelets regularly every you know two weeks. Um, but once they're no longer able, we need those new donors coming in to become regular donors so that we don't have these shortages of blood. Uh, so these patients can rely on getting what they need in the hospital. Um, here at Children's, we also had our mobile program put on hold due to the pandemic. Um, but fortunately, we were able to come back very strong and um, as far as diversity, we partner with the Colorado Sickle Cell Association, so that helps us get the word out amongst groups of different um, backgrounds. And um, we feel very fortunate that we're able to achieve 98 to 100% self-sufficiency at this time based on our um, amazing community involvement. That's percentages referring to the blood you need and the blood you're able to provide or you know, get on, bring, some bring in and um, get to our patients. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. And that sounds like a great partnership. It is fantastic. We are very grateful. So the takeaway message from all of this is that people need to donate, no matter what your blood type, where you're coming from, we need all types. Mm -hmm. um, Brooke, going back to what you just said about mm -hmm. the 90 gallon <laughs> clubbers, um, can you, talk about incentives or promotions or things that Vitalant does um, to celebrate and encourage donors? Yeah, of course. You know, we love all of our donors. We would like to thank them more and do more than we do. Uh, but, you know, it's it's hard to be able to do that financially as a nonprofit. So we try our best to thank our donors with some incentives and promotions. You know, through the summer, we've already done a lot of like win one of three, you know, $5,000 gift cards um, with our national organization. Um, and of course, our donors love that. We, we love calling those donors and saying, you've won this um, for donating. That's amazing. 
pleasing for us to see. Uh, we do a lot of t-shirt promotion. So if you donate in a certain month, you can get this really awesome t-shirt um, redeemable online. Uh, so we're doing those all of the time, but we really love our also our local partnerships as well here in Colorado. Uh, we partner with a lot of breweries to do like a pint for pint. So you donate a pint of blood, you get a voucher to drink a pint at another day. <laughs> we don't want you drinking the same day you get. <laughs> um, but things like that, you know, Loveland Ski Area just did, you know, everyone who came to their blood drive this winter got a free pass for a lift ticket. So that was really cool. So things like that are just amazing. They get people in and excited uh, to donate. So we try our best to provide some perks for these amazing volunteers that give their time to save lives. I think that's really nice. People like to, you know, get free things and be honored. And then you guys recognize people who are regular donors and celebrate their mm -hmm. major milestones, right? Yeah, you know, obviously we love our first time donors, our 10 gallon donors, but we really kind of go all out for these high gallon donors. Um, we just, like I said, did a 90 gallon celebration at our um, Denver West Center not too long ago. We got this donor a cake. We made them a big, um, you know, poster board and we uh, honored them with a sweatshirt. So, you know, just little things to show. We appreciate you coming in throughout your lifetime over and over again uh, to save just countless lives with that many donations. How long does it take to get to 90 gallons? <laughs> well, a lot of these donors are in their, you know, late 70s, early 80s. So quite some time. But again, it's those platelet donations that really add up. Um, you know, they usually start with whole blood in their early donation days, and then they switch to those platelets um, later on in life. And so it really just adds up over time. That's amazing. Frida, how about Children's Colorado? How do you recognize your donors? Well, we have donor coins for donors who make it to 25 donations, 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300 and above. Um, and we also honor them when they come in for each of those milestones with like a gift basket. Um, we also are doing t-shirt promotions and we also have a donor wall outside of our center where we put the names of people who have achieved significant donation milestones here at the center. And yes, sometimes it takes decades for these donors to get to 300 or more donations. They are truly amazing giving people. That is incredible. I love all that. Andrea, how about in New York? What do you guys do? Um, we do all of the same. Um, I will say that I, my favorite incentives or donor thank yous are those that are the partnership. So August is pint for pint across our 13 states. And I think it's less about the, you know, the voucher for beer, you know, on another day we do it the same way. It's more about the breweries stepping up and amplifying our message on our behalf and making the act of thinking about giving blood, giving blood fun. So those are my favorite versus donate and get X. We also had a partnership uh, in March with food banks and I was so inspired. They go through, you know, so many similar challenges and they hosted their own drive. We donated a dollar on behalf of blood donors to the food bank. So it was kind of a two for one, uh, but it was such a good PR opportunity. Uh, so it, those are the things that are fun for me. Um, we also do a lot of donor patient introductions. So I had mentioned one earlier, one sickle cell patient, her name is Stacy Sotil. We introduced her to 30 of her actual blood donors. So it's not a donor thank you, but that then becomes the messaging for our donors. We'll send a video clip saying this is someone that, um, you know, that you've helped. And so put a face on that. That's incredible. I love a good collaboration and it's just, it just works out amazing. It amplifies everybody's message and I think it's great. I love the pint for a pint thing. I know um, Vitalin's done it with, uh, who was it? Culver's. So pint of ice cream has another option. Uh, it's just, it's great. Yeah. I like the idea of making it fun and then also having them help 
share the message one more way. We also, this time of year is, well, May to September is Girl Scout cookie season, at least in many of our states. And we actually got 160,000 um, donation of cookies. So you can divide that by four or $5 a box. But so we gave, you know, give blood, get cookies is always fun, but Girl Scout cookies. So they were donated great press for them. They expire in September. So you use them in a, you know, 30 day period. So it's right after the cookie sales, but they haven't quite sold them all. If you don't have a partnership with your Girl Scouts, uh, find, <laughs> find the connection. Cause that's great. That is also a great idea. Brooke, we often get the question about whether people could get paid to donate. I know when I was in college, I had friends that would go and give plasma and make 20 bucks or whatever. And so people are constantly asking if it's a paid thing that they can do. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so, you know, Vitalin relies on the generosity of our volunteer blood donors. You know, everyone's a volunteer who comes in to our centers and drives. Um, you know, studies have shown that volunteer donors actually provide a safer blood supply all around. Um, the FDA regulates those labeling of the blood products um, for transfusion, and that indicates whether that product came from a volunteer or a paid donor. And so those who receive payment, um, you know, for plasma, say at those plasma centers that are paid, those actually go to places like pharmaceutical companies to make pharmaceutical products or uh, sometimes, you know, makeup. So those plasma um, donations that are given at those plasma paid centers aren't actually going directly to patients. So that's something I think a lot of people that don't um, understand the difference between that. So when you're coming to a Vitalant Center or Children's or New York Blood, um, that's going to a patient in need directly versus those paid centers of plasma. They go to more um, companies, I, I would say. That's good information for people to know because we have gotten that question quite a few times. And I was under the impression it just wasn't a thing anymore that you, it was all altruistic, all voluntary. Um, so thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. kind of what the difference is. Andrea or Frida, any follow up to that? I would just say uh, hospitals want the, the label, uh, exactly how Brooke said. The FDA requires you label it paid or volunteer and hospitals much prefer blood supply. It is safer. There's a lot of data that, you know, if you're donating because you want to versus being paid, um, that it's a safer blood supply. Okay. We've got one final question. Andrea, I'm going to go to you with this. Why should someone be a blood donor? The easiest is because you can, um, you can't manufacture blood. Of course, uh, Lots of organizations are working on that, and maybe sometime in our lifetime we will find a product that transports oxygen. Um, there's a military, you know, um, sort of blood substitute. But short of that, there is absolutely no substitute for life-saving blood, platelets, and plasma. And when you need it, you need it. And it's not only the right product at the right time. It's in the right volume, in the right type, in the antigen neg, and it's perishable, you know, like our milk or our eggs. So if everyone in the U.S. donated tomorrow in 42 days or so, we would be out of blood. So it is a constant need. And what else can you do in 45 minutes to an hour where you're guaranteed to save a life and really um, make a difference? So... That was a great answer. Frida, why should someone become a blood donor? Um, blood donation is a simple but impactful way to make a difference in the life of a child. And it helps ensure a steady, readily available supply of blood products so all of our patients do get the treatment that they need while they're here at Children's Hospital Colorado. Also very well stated. And Brooke, why should someone become a blood donor? Yeah, I think, you know, one donation can save up to three lives, too. Uh, so it's very impactful. And we don't want patients in the hospital 
to ever be in a situation where they may not get the transfusion that they need because the supply wasn't there. So we really need these donors, uh, new and regular, to come in throughout the year to prevent these blood shortages and make sure we have a constant supply. Um, and for patients like Chris Klug, who, you know, needed transfusions as well for an organ transplant. I mean, there's so many reasons patients need blood for cancer, for blood disorder, sickle cell. They're just countless. So um, it's such a need and constant, like Andrea said. So we really need donors. All powerful statements about why people should do it. Is there any reason a person shouldn't do it? Aside if they're not eligible. Um, to find out your um, HIV status. You know, that used to be a thought where people, um, you know, that's not what you should do. The blood supply should be, uh, you should donate presuming that your blood will be transfused into a patient. I would just also add that the pandemic uh, revealed the fragility of our nation's blood supply in a way that we had never seen. And 50% of our youth donors across the nation have disappeared. You know, it used to be your first experience giving blood was to get out of chemistry class and go donate with your friends in the school gym. And it's a positive, you know, peer experience. And that, uh, those donations are, half of them are gone and we're working to rebuild them. We lost three years of kids donating blood, which means they're not gonna go on to college. They're not gonna go on to their first job and donate. There also used to be excess blood somewhere in the nation at any given point in time. So if you had a blizzard in Denver or Nor'easter or a Hurricane Harvey in Texas, we, we shared with one another. And there is no surplus in the U.S. blood supply right now. So in disaster preparedness and sustainability, there isn't a better time to raise awareness about the need for blood. If a person donates, will they find out if their blood is used? You know, we, um, we send donors a, a text. Um, we have a couple of programs. One is where your blood went. So we can't tell you that it went to a cancer patient, but we'll tell you what hospital it went to. So you get a text and it says your platelets were used at you know, the name of the hospital. We're also part of the Oklahoma Blood Institute Thank the Donor program, which I love. That's a way for um, family members and patients while they're receiving a unit to just take the app, scan the unit of blood and write a message. That message comes back to the blood center anonymously. We check it to make sure that it doesn't have, you know, a hospital band or a dry erase board in the background, anything that would make it non-anonymous, but it can be a video, a photo, or just a written thank you message. And then we are able by that barcode to send it to the actual donor and say, this is who got your blood minus the name, but the photos are amazing. So people should visit the thank the donor website. It's pretty amazing. That is incredible. Okay. Thank the donor is the website. Okay. I'm going to look at that. Frida, how about Children's Colorado? Do you guys let donors know when their blood has been used? Uh, right now, our center is not equipped to provide transfusion notifications, but because all the blood given at Children's Co Hospital Colorado or at one of our mobile blood drives goes directly to one of the patients in our care. That's pretty incredible that it just happens right there. And Brooke, how about with my talent? Yeah, we do. We send texts and emails um, uh, to our donors when it's been at, sent to a hospital. So that's pretty neat. Yeah, I have received some of those having been a donor and I can say it's my favorite text or email to receive. It just, it feels amazing. Because I think it's easy to assume that you donate the blood and it goes somewhere, but like speaking about the platelets with their short shelf life, you know, or if something doesn't test out with your blood. So then getting that notification that it was actually used is really a powerful thing. Um, that's all the questions we have before we wrap it up. Does anybody else have any lingering thoughts or points they want to make? 
I just want to thank you for holding this to help get the word out and spread awareness about the need. And um, I'm just loving what your foundation's doing um, in partnering with people like us to host drives all the time <laughs> and being so active on social about it, which we love. So thank you guys. We agree. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Absolutely. You guys are so welcome. And thank you guys for what you do. We love partnering with blood donation centers, putting on blood drives, however we can help get the word out because obviously all the messages go together and you can't do organ and tissue transplantation without blood. And so we're happy to help help share that message. And National Donor Day, February 14th, we focus on trying to promote blood drives. So keep an eye out. And if anyone wants to partner further on it or here. Um, so thank you guys. And also January's National Blood Donor Month. Thank you. Yes, for pointing that out. Appreciate that. Um, thank you guys again for your time and sharing your knowledge about blood donation. I want to thank our viewers for watching this session. We hope you found it inspiring and informative. Reminder that if you have any additional questions for today's panel, or if you want to learn more about this year's webinar series, check out chriskludefoundation.org backslash CKF webinar series, or email us at info at chriskludefoundation.org. We here at the Chris Klug Foundation wish you all a great day. Stay safe and stay healthy. Go donate blood and live life, give life.